Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I would be grateful for short and succinct questions and answers. Uh, question one, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the devolution of air passenger duty will help the Ayrshire economy. And the Secretary, Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government's plans for a devolved air passenger duty will greatly assist the Ayrshire economy and the wider Scottish economy. We are committed to an initial 50% reduction in APD and will move to full abolition when public finances permit. This will help all of Scotland's airports compete more fairly and assist them in securing new and existing routes. Our analysis has suggested that a 50% cut could deliver more than 1 million additional passengers annually. It will enable Glasgow Presswick Airport to approach airlines more confidently in the pursuit of new route opportunities. Ryanair has indicated that if APD was abolished, it would double its passenger numbers in Scotland, which would provide significant benefits to passengers, businesses and our tourism sector, as well as to the airports involved. So we have urged the UK Government to act on the Smith Commission recommendation and devolve APD now. This view is shared by Scotland's main airport who have written to each of the Westminster party leaders urging quick progress. Many thanks. Uh, Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Indeed, uh, Michael O'Leary, as the uh, Cabinet Secretary said, in a response to a question on this at the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, that he could double the number of passengers coming to, to Presswick if APD was to go. Would the Cabinet Secretary be able to give me an assurance that if the power over, over APD is transferred under the Smith proposals, that it be enacted as soon as possible? in order to maximise the benefits for the wider economy in Ayrshire. Secretary. Obviously, it's incumbent upon us to act as quickly as possible when we have that power. But the first thing that has to happen, of course, as uh, Willie Coffey knows, is for that power to be devolved. We continue to press the UK government to devolve APD as a matter of urgency. A number of studies in recent years have shown the negative imp economic impacts of APD as applied by the UK government. Uh, and Scotland's airports frequently tell us that APD represents a barrier to the route development efforts. And we've seen from the sale of slots and withdrawal of routes the impact APD is having on airlines. And the Chancellor's recent decision to remove the two highest APD bans from April and to abolish APD for children under 12 from May have attracted good UK media coverage, but the economic impact for Scotland is anticipated to be limited. This seems to be a very slow uh, devolution of power. First agreed, of course, in 2009. Um, it seems to be about the same kind of process as the Chilcot report, both starting in 2009, mm -hmm. neither of which is really produced yet, and not so much a, a breakneck pace as a brass neck uh, uh, lack of action on the part of the UK government. Alex Johnson. The will be aware that I share his uh, intent when it comes to the reduction or the abolition of air passenger duty. But in relation to the question that's asked, what evidence does he have to suggest that the reduction or uh, abolition of APD would benefit Prestwick? And is it not a dangerous uh, possibility that it might boost the airline industry and other airports without benefiting Prestwick at all? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think I've have answered that previously, but I think even if we just take the example which I gave of uh, Ryanair, who said that they expect a higher increase, I think, in Edinburgh Airport, I think a million and a half from memory in terms of passenger numbers, but a million new passengers, if there was to be complete abolition of APD for Presswick, is what they've uh, said, and doubling uh, things currently has also been mentioned by uh, by Ryanair. But in addition to that, of course, and unlike the comment from his uh, colleague Gavin Brown, who said there was no question the benefit of any reduction uh, in flights uh, going from Scottish airports in terms of APD, uh, the fact is, if you make it easier for people to take their holiday destinations from Scottish airports, you improve the economic performance of that airport, plus all the supporting uh, jobs which go towards the operation of that airport. So we have that evidence. The York Aviation Study gives that evidence. Ryanair gives that evidence. And we are confident if we can get on and do this, if the UK government ever gets round to devolving APD, then we could see huge benefits for Presswick and all of Scotland's airports. Many thanks. Uh, question two, Hans Alamalek. Thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to mi minimise disruption to passengers and businesses during the renovation of Queen Street, uh, Glasgow Derek Queen Street Mackay. Station. A network Rail and ScotRail are working together to deliver the redevelopment of Queen Street Station. In addition, Transport Scotland and their industry partners are working alongside Glasgow City Council, Buchanan Galleries, Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, Passenger Focus and SPT to develop a robust management plan which will ensure the absolute minimum of disruption to the travelling public. Gonzalo Malik. Uh, thank you very much for that response and I welcome the planned upgrade of the station which is the third busiest in Scotland. 
as part of the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Plan Egypt. However, the, the project is planned to have a four-year construction period until 2019. And I have some concerns that the work will have a negative impact on how Queen Street connects with other modes of transport and access to, for disabled passengers. Can the minister assure me that uh, the access to uh, passengers will not be impaired in any way and that the re permissionment will go through perhaps even sooner rather than later? Minister. Well, I think this far out from the start date, it's very difficult to say the project will go quicker uh, than planned. But what I'll give a commitment to do is ensure that all those very relevant issues are considered and there's clear oversight of them in terms of access and the benefits of the work, connecting with the Edinburgh-Glasgow Improvement Project, the station redevelopment, the partnership with Glasgow City Council and other partners. We want to ensure that it is all tied in together and I'll work very closely with our agencies to make it so. There are massive benefits in the station redevelopment uh, and they should be realised. So I'm very sensitive to the issues around access and so on, and I make sure that we're all uh, cited on this uh, as we work our way through to further assist all members in Parliament with all the issues around the uh, rail improvement project and the station's upgrade. I intend to hold a presentation so that members can hear of all the factors uh, in relation to this uh, multi-million pound work and how it will bring immense benefits to the country. Thank you. Sandra White. Thank, thank you very much, President Officer, and uh, thank the Minister for his reply. I think it's a very exciting time uh, for Glasgow and for Queen Street in my constituency. Uh, the Minister mentioned benefits in his answer. Can you tell me exactly what improvements, if you do have an exact area there, what improvements will be brought to the commuters uh, in that area at Queen Street and also the businesses? Minister. Well, just like uh, Sandra White's excited, I'm excited too with uh, this uh, project, as you would expect, specifically the benefits of this £120 million redevelopment will transform Queen Street Station into a world-class 21st century integrated transport hub, future-proofing capacity well into the next decade. And passengers using the newly redeveloped station will benefit from improved accessibility, enhanced station facilities and direct access to the Buchanan Gallery's development. There will be, it's inevitable, working on a live railway and an operational station, there will be some disruption, but we will try and minimise that to maximise the benefits that will emerge as part of this exciting project. And briefly, John Mason. Uh, I wonder if the Minister can say anything about can we encourage passengers going from Queen Street to Edinburgh to use the low-level service uh, through Airdrie and Bathgate, which is excellent. Minister. Well, of course, I would agree uh, with uh, John Mason in that point. We will be using uh, a range of, of diversions to ensure that we can maintain as much of the network uh, as possible to make sure there's that connectiveness that's there. And, of course, that's why the, the line there will be of such benefit in addition to, to what was first envisaged. So, of course, we'll use everything we can to try and minimise disruption to the travelling public to continue to give the rail network the support that it deserves and continue to increase passenger numbers. Excellent. Question three, Ken McIntosh. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assurance it can provide that Clyde and Hebridean ferry services will not be privatised. Mr. Okay. The next Clyde and Hebrides ferry services contract will comply with European law and be tendered in the same way as it was for the current contract's tender process uh, between 2005-07. With the contract being awarded to the operator submitting the most economically advantageous uh, tender, notwithstanding the need to tender the services, the operator will have to comply with a service specification defined by Scottish ministers and, as now, will be subject to stringent contract management arrangements. We clearly cannot prejudge who the successful bidder will be, but I can confirm to the Chamber that the Clyde and Hebrides services will remain under the control of Scottish ministers throughout the contract. Ken McIntosh. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer? Uh, although I am not sure if uh, Islanders and those who rely on those ferry services will be entirely reassured, he's, is he aware of the anxiety that is felt that uh, the services might be sold off to a company like Serco, just as the Government has sold off the overnight sleeper service to London? And can he assure Islanders at least that the services will be retained as one bundle? and will not be sold off individually, uh, so there will be the, the most profitable uh, elements selected by the private company. 
Minister, uh, as me. to the direct question that the member asked, yes, it will be packaged uh, as uh, one bundle, and we'll be very clear on the specifications that are required uh, to address the needs uh, of, of the, the travelling public and, of course, islanders that I'm very sensitive to in my capacity as Minister for Transport uh, and Islands. But I don't, I don't accept in its entirety the characterisation from Ken McIntosh. This is the same process that the Labour Party deployed uh, when you were making these decisions, and we will ensure uh, that the islanders get the best possible service and we will keep a very close oversight into the tendering process. And we cannot, must not, indeed it would be illegal, to prejudge the outcome of that process. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. <coughs> Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment uh, to these vital services and wonder if the Minister can update uh, the Parliament on the rollout of RET, Clyde and Hebrides ferry services later this year. Mr. Uh, RET will be rolled out for passengers' cars, small commercial vehicles and coaches to the remaining Clyde and Hebrides routes in October this year, as we committed to in the ferries plan. The Scottish Government is committed to supporting our island and remote communities, and RET underpins the Scottish Government's commitment to providing one single overarching fares policy across Scotland's entire ferry network. And I know that delivery of RET to the remaining Clyde and Hebrides routes will be warmly welcomed by those communities. Dave Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Further to Ken McIntosh's uh, question, will the Minister confirm the exact timing for the tender? and whether he will involve in the future the island authorities in the tender process. And finally, will he agree with me that an integrated public sector operator is good news for jobs, services and fares? I am happy to write to the member with the exact details on the timescales, if that is uh, of assistance, and give a guarantee, yes, there will be uh, future and an ongoing engagement. There has been engagement. And I've been very clear with uh, island authorities that in conducting my business in the way that we propose to in the prospectus to Scotland's islands, then there will be even deeper and wider engagement on such matters. So, yes to more consultation, and I'll give the exact specifics on the timetabling of the announcement of the successful bidder to the member and any other member that's so interested. Thanks. Question for John Pentland. To ask the Scottish gov Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure and Investment in Cities last met North Lanarkshire Council and what was discussed. Keith Brown. Uh, I had a chance to visit North Lanarkshire in my previous position as Minister for Transport and Veterans to witness the progress on the rail network in the area as part of the Edinburgh to Glasgow Improvements Programme. I have not yet, however, had the opportunity in my new role to meet with North Lanarkshire Council. Benland. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response? And given that Ravenscraig is now a major national priority, will he look at what further Sc the Scottish Government can do to support that, that can be given in attracting investment? And, for example, could the growth accelerator model unlock more funding than TIF? And will he agree to meet with myself and other interested parties in the near future? Absolutely. First of all, can I say I'm more than happy to meet with the member to discuss the issues which he's raised. Um, some of those issues, I think, are impacted by the Glasgow and Clyde City deal, which has been struck, and of course, which uh, North Lanarkshire are a key part of. And they have a number of projects which they themselves, I think the member will be aware of those, they have prioritised as part of that city deal. Um, I've not yet seen an approach in terms of the growth accelerator model, but I'm more than happy, as I've said, to discuss that with the members and others who want to bring along to that meeting uh, when that takes place. Neil Finlay. North Lanarkshire Council, like other councils, are experiencing service cuts and job losses because of the underfunding of the council tax freeze. Does the Minister agree with John Stevenson of Unison, who said last week, if there were 40,000 job losses in any other sector, there would be calls for an inquiry from politicians? Uh, uh, can I say, first of all, that uh, perhaps then uh, Neil Finlay's colleagues shouldn't have voted for the Tory austerity yeah. programme at Westminster. Yeah. That is the source of these cuts. And perhaps he could also take up that issue with his colleague. I think it was Liam Byrne, the last Chief Secretary to the Treasury, who left a note, the last word of the last Labour government, there is no money left. That's a legacy that Labour left us. Mr. Finlay, so perhaps enough. he should apologise to those 40,000 employees for the part that Labour has played in the cuts of local government. Thank you. Question five, Adam Ingram. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the rail investment proposals in the Industrial Community Alliance's paper, Tracks to Work. Mr. Derek Mackay. 
The Scottish Government welcomes this report and agrees with the need to rebalance the UK economy away from an over-reliance on London. We also recognise the critical role the rail industry has to support our businesses and communities by connecting towns, cities and rural areas, improving access to employment and education. We have embarked on a five-year, £5 billion programme of railway investment across the network, including key projects such as the Edinburgh to Glasgow Improvement Programme, the Borders Railway, Aberdeen to Inverness Rail Improvements and the Highland Mainline Rail Improvements. I, I thank the Minister for his response, but could I ask him specifically what investment is planned for the Glasgow South Western Line that will improve the frequency of the service and are there any plans to add a new rail halt at Mauchlin? Cabinet say, uh, Minister. At once rolling stock is available from December 2017, an enhanced timetable on the Glasgow Dumfries Carlisle route can be operated with more frequent services, better connections, catering on board and refreshed rolling stock, plus dedicated great Scottish scenic trains journeys demonstrating Scottish Minister's commitment to improving rail services and connectivity across the Scottish network. The Scottish Government has no current plans to open a railway station at Mauchlin. Uh, funding for new railway stations can be considered under the £30 million Scottish Stations Fund, which aims to lever in third-party funding to promote and improve the new stations. But the responsibility to demonstrate the need for station improvements, however, lies with the relevant promoter, for example, local authorities, and regional transport uh, partnerships or developers. And I'd be more than happy to uh, work with the member to take such an application forward. Many thanks. Uh, Mary Fee, briefly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Much of the investment in rail infrastructure has been in the central belt or city areas. Borders Rail is a notable exception to that. And Tracks to Work makes the point that reopening existing lines is a cheaper alternative to investment in new services. And the investment generates growth through jobs. For example, 1,000 workers are employed on Border Rail. And many of the lines which were closed in Scotland are in rural areas is, with poor connectivity and little access to jobs. So does the Minister have any plans to reopen any lines previously closed, giving a welcome economic boost, or is that something he's willing to consider in future planning? Minister? Well, of course, the Scottish Government would be happy to consider any approach to, to extend and reopen lines. I think Borders is a great example of how we're doing that. And the station fund will also unlock opportunities to, to lever in external funding to open up stations as well. So we'd encourage partners to be as creative as possible, and we'll happily extend and expand the rail network. But we are bound, of course, with the financial constraints that we are presented with, largely from the capital reductions in Westminster, again, that should be challenged. But in terms of our proactive, encouraging approach, I would encourage all to, to take forward proposals to extend rail because we know that it's increasingly popular and will serve Scotland well in terms of sustainability agenda in the future. Many thanks. Question six, Dennis Rob. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what improvements are planned to upgrade the road and rail network in Aberdeenshire. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Yeah, the Scottish Government is addressing years of underinvestment in the North East with schemes currently committed, including the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, Balmeri Tipperty, Aberdeen Inverness Rail Improvements, Inveramsey Bridge, and Harrigan Roundabout, totalling almost £1 billion. By 2030, the planned £3 billion investment on the A96 duelling between Inverness and Aberdeen will provide further vital improvements that will benefit the area. Dennis Robertson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that extremely positive answer. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this is in actually keeping with the Government's proposal and strategy for economic growth and will provide uh, jobs uh, for the North East and is testament to the Government's plans in securing employment within the North East sector? Absolutely. Of course, the member's question is a very uh, topical one, uh, given uh, some of the recent developments in the North East. But the Scottish Government, for our part, fully appreciate the important link that investment in road and rail infrastructure plays in the creation and sustainment of jobs in the North East. And that's demonstrated by the programme of investment which I've just outlined. Uh, as an example of that, the construction of the AWPR alone is expected to lead to over 14,000 jobs being generated over the first 30 years after the scheme opens. And it's estimated it will generate over £6 billion in additional 
additional income for the North East by reducing costs to businesses and providing opportunities for increased sales. And we can contrast that positive action by the Scottish Government with the dithering over oil taxation that we are currently seeing from the UK Government, which demonstrates that the Scottish Government is doing the job that is necessary to make sure that we increase economic activity and job opportunities in the North East. We now move to portfolio questions on culture, Europe and external affairs. My apologies to those questioners I have un been unable to call this afternoon. Question 1, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet uh, Ofcom to discuss broadcasting issues. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop, if and when you are ready, please. Uh, I'm due to meet Professor Philip Schlesinger, uh, the Ofcom Content Board Member for Scotland on Wednesday, the 28th of January, and a meeting is currently being arranged with the Chair of Ofcom at her request. Dave Thompson. I uh, thank the Cabinet uh, Secretary for her answer. And given that the SNP is the third largest political party in the UK, I, I wonder if she could let me know what she feels about Ofcom's position in terms of uh, preventing the SNP uh, uh, to appear in the general election broadcasts which are being looked at at the moment, uh, along with parties like Plaid Cymru uh, and the Greens, and yet they appear to be proposing that UKIP, a small party, tiny party, in terms of uh, comparison with the S SNP, may be, may be given a position in these debates. Well, Ofcom does not directly regulate debates, but the, the point that the, make, the member is making, I think, is in terms of consultation of the major parties. Uh, the SNP is now the third largest party in terms of membership in the United Kingdom. Um, I think the decision not to consult uh, is one that is both illogical and undemocratic. Uh, but I must make clear that when I meet with Ofcom, I will be meeting as the um, relevant Cabinet Secretary in relation to SNP government policy. And obviously the issues the member raises are quite rightly dealt with uh, by the relevant party uh, spokesperson. Thank you very much. Question two, Marta Fraser. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to promote major events in Scotland. Uh, this year sees Scotland Play host a fantastic programme of major events, including World Championships in gymnast uh, Gymnastics, IPC Swimming and Eventing, uh, European Championships in Judo and Orienteering, as well as the Davis Cup, the Open, uh, the Turner Prize and the Mobile Awards, having further enhanced our reputation as a world-leading events destination through the highly successful delivery of last year's major events. The Scottish Government will continue to ensure Scotland has a rich and sustainable programme of events that is effectively promoted at home and internationally. With the aim of maximising economic impact, major events are promoted through Visit Scotland's international and domestic campaigns using a wide range of marketing channels, including social media, PR, television, advertising, direct mailing. And last year, the Visit Scotland consumer website alone had approximately 14 million unique visitors. Many thanks. Marta Fraser. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? She mentioned the Open, uh, which is coming to St Andrews in July. Um, what specifically will the Scottish Government and its agencies do to ensure that we are maximising the economic opportunity to fife from this event, which will attract a, a worldwide audience of many million, uh, and try and make sure that as many of these people as possible come to visit Fife in the years to come? Well, in terms of the members' region, there, is a, there are a range of activities taking place, uh, a particular focus on uh, the Mid-Scotland and Fife area, uh, in particular in a range of different areas, because it's not just that one event, it's come to, to that uh, region for a, a range of areas um, and in a range of activities, and there's a, a numerous number of events taking place. In terms of the specific areas, in terms of tourism, you'll recognise I'm not the tourist minister. I'm happy to ask Fergus Ewing, the relevant tourism minister, um, to help give him an idea of how how uh, the government is helping support Visit Scotland to ensure people stay longer, uh, spend more money and uh, boost the, the, the economy uh, and the benefit of that uh, Open Golf Championship. Any thanks? Question three, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Creative Scotland and what issues were discussed. Uh, the Scottish Government and Creative Scotland have regular meetings at all levels covering a broad range of issues. Uh, these include monthly, uh, monthly formal update meetings through its sponsor team as well as regular meetings about specific projects. Uh, I last met Janet Archer, the Chief Executive of Creative Scotland, uh, last Thursday at the brilliant opening concert of Celtic Connection celebrating Martin Bennett's work. Uh, last week I announced Richard Finlay as the new Chair of Creative Scotland and I'm sure members would want to wish him well in his new role. 
Thank you. Neil Bibby. Thank the Minister for the answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of evidence to the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee this morning from the film industry, which raised concerns over Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise. Scottish Enterprise published a report back in a film studio in March last year. We've heard nothing since. In contrast to the growing film sectors in Wales and Northern Ireland, how does she respond to concerns that there's a lack of vision and leadership for the film sector in Scotland and that we're missing out on significant productions? Well, this government has provided significant support for the um, film and television uh, industry. I would point out that in terms of total, total figures for screen support from 2002, and seven to 2013-14, what we inherited was £16.2 million of screen support in 2007. That level went to 2013-14 to £21.6 million. I absolutely share um, the focus and determination in relation to uh, permanent film studio provision in Scotland. Uh, I think it's important not only to attract inward investment, but also to help the Indigenous um, uh, industry here in Scotland. Uh, you will be aware that there are currently uh, several private fun uh, privately funded studio proposals currently being consulted on. Uh, while that is in action, it is very difficult in relation to Scottish Government's public funding to be pr provided without breaking EU state aid rules. And he will un undoubtedly be familiar with the, uh, the situation in Spain, where there was a significant clawback from uh, public funding for a publicly funded studio because it was seen to not comply with EU state aid rules. However, having said that, I am absolutely determined that we will see progress and I'm looking forward to uh, discussing uh, creative industries issues more generally, but also I suspect on film uh, with the relevant committee when I give evidence in the next few weeks. Many thanks. Reminding all members, brief questions and answers will be appreciated. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary, in light of what uh, she has just said, why is it that in 2013 the Scottish Government made a very specific commitment to the film industry for a £2 million uh, um, grant and that has not been spent? Well, I'm sure the member will examine um, the budget proposals. Uh, particularly, it was not a £2 million grant. It was a £2 million loan fund. When you're dealing with the private sector, they can decide whether they want to access that loan fund or not access that loan fund. But obviously, had there been market failure or were there to be market failure, and that funding could be used in a different way with the public sector. But it's uh, quite clearly a provision that we have made, um, and that is uh, available as we go forward in relation to film support. Many thanks. Claire Baker. Um, given the strength of feeling expressed by the film industry this morning, including claims that Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise are not fit for purpose, will the Cabinet Secretary hold an urgent meeting between Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise to address these concerns? Well, um, I, I've yet to have a, a full readout from this morning, but uh, a number of the people who are giving evidence um, I have met and regularly meet. Uh, some of the issues um, uh, in particular I am familiar with. I think there are some issues in terms of how you can balance the uh, economic enterprise focus that, creative, uh, that uh, Scottish Enterprise have and the lead uh, role that Creative Scotland have in relation to arts and screen. This is not a new issue. This is a long-standing issue. However, it must be resolved, and I share her point and the points being made this morning, that they should be resolved, and that's what I will take responsibility to achieve. Many thanks. Point of order, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Point of order is, this is an ongoing evidence uh, session with the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, and we are to meet with uh, Creative Scotland next week to, and, uh, uh, and Scottish Enterprise to take evidence. I think it's inappropriate that the member raises that subject in the chamber this afternoon. Um, Thank you for your point of order, Mr Robertson, but it is indeed not a point of order. Members are free, by and large, to raise whatever issues they choose in here in Parliament. That's what it's for. Question five, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to recognise Holocaust Memorial Day and the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Minister Humza Yousaf. Uh, the First Minister will attend the National Scottish Holocaust Memorial Event 2015 in air on the 27th of January to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau and the 20th anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide. The Scottish Government has financially supported the development of the 2015 event through a grant of £8,000 to Interfaith Scotland. I will be uh, personally attending the Glasgow Schools Holocaust Memorial Event and the Holocaust Memorial Day reception here in the Scottish Parliament. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Like all of us, he will have been appalled by the recent rise in anti-Semitism in both the UK and Europe, leading to acts of violence and indiscriminate murder. 
What will the Scottish Government do to help counter anti-Semitism and ensure that Jews feel safe and welcome here in Scotland? Minister. I thank the member for a really important uh, question. Of course, I absolutely share his concern uh, in terms of uh, anti-Semitism and also at the horrific actions that took place in, in Paris and those incidents that were specifically targeted towards the Jewish community. All of us uh, are united in our uh, condemnation uh, and indeed are hurt at those events. Uh, the Scottish Government values the important role that the Jewish community plays in enriching our lives here uh, in Scotland. Uh, in terms of hate crimes, uh, wider, it's, it's, it's important to say that uh, actually hate crimes uh, have decreased over the 2013 14 period compared to 2012-13. Uh, but, all that being said, uh, since June 2014 till the 20th of January of this year, there have been 57 reported incidents of anti-Semitism. That is, by this government standard, 57 incidents far too many. The uh, Scottish Government works closely with the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities and many other organisations uh, to stamp out anti-Semitism. For example, a recently uh, Scottish Government funded Speak Up Against Hate Crime programme will continue to reassure the Jewish community of Scotland that we uh, absolutely uh, appreciate uh, and, uh, their, their contribution to Scotland and will continue to work uh, closely with them so that they feel safe in Scotland. Many thanks. Question six, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the budget priorities are in 2015-16 for the Culture, Europe and External Affairs portfolio. Uh, the Culture, Europe and External Affairs portfolio budget has been prioritised to maintain delivery of frontline services, including free access to our national museums and galleries, to deliver key capital projects in the cultural and heritage sectors, and to maximise our international profile. The full explanation of budget priorities for 1516 for the portfolio are set out in Chapter 11 of the Scottish Government's draft budget for 1516, published in October 2014. Gavin Brown. Grateful for that, Presiding Officer. Um, according to Spice, this portfolio has gone from having 1% of the total Scottish budget in 2010-11 to 0.8% and now to 0.7% in 1516. Why is this? Uh, I'm happy to provide uh, further detail in writing after this, after, this, after this question. Some of it are internal transfers between government for different areas, for example, in relation to homecoming or other areas, precisely the areas that I discussed with the um, committee uh, when I've given evidence, not just this year and previous years. Uh, we have maintained our International Development Fund. We've maintained our grants that Historic Scotland give in terms of provision for uh, renovation, heritage, etc., We've protected our national companies um, and also our national uh, collections, and we've also uh, protected Creative Scotland going forward as well. So actually we've achieved a tremendous amount. And I think uh, the member, if he reflects on the cuts, I think DCMS and the Arts Council have seen significant cuts in their um, arts budget going forward, and we've seen, obviously, um, the Labour Party saying that they would maintain those cuts. And I think if you talk to the cultural sector in Scotland, they'd far rather have an SNP government protect protecting their cultural services here in Scotland because the prospects of what's happening down south are really very uh, distressing indeed for the artistic and cultural community. Many thanks. Anne McTaggart. Thanks, President Officer. From that um, ever-decreasing budget, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us of what the organisations that do receive some of that budget, of what, how many of them are living wage employers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, in terms of our budget, uh, the one thing I would say in relation to not just this question, but the next question, uh, as we go forward to the 15-16 budget, you will actually see um, some increases um, in our budgets going forward. Europe and external affairs up to 17.9. Culture 150.6 to 174.7. And historic Scotland going up from 37.8 to 40.1. In relation to the organisations, I'll be pleased to, to let you know that in terms of those that are part of the government's pay, public pay policy, they do uh, receive the living wage. And I was particularly pleased, for example, that the National Museums of Scotland Enterprise was one of the first, not part of the Scottish Government pay policy, to implement the living wage for its staff as well. So everybody knows that in terms of pursuing the living wage, um, all organisations uh, within the Scottish Government's pay policy are in the benef benefit of not only the living wage, but for those that are earning less than 21,000, an increase in uh, increase as well and that matters a lot in the culture and heritage sector where comparatively to other in comparison to other areas there are more people that are on low pay in that sector mm. thanks question seven neil finley 
To ask the Scottish Government how many of its staff work in the Culture and, Heri and Heritage and External Affairs Directorates. Uh, there are 50 people who work in the Directorate for Culture and Heritage, full-time equivalent of 47.4. There are 92 people who work in the Directorate for External Affairs, uh, full-time equivalent of 89.6. Finlay? In our wider portfolio, there are uh, low-paid staff working in the National Museums, where for those who have been employed since the 1st of January 2011, they now work in a two-tier workforce, receiving up to £3,000 less than their colleagues <coughs> excuse me, who have been there prior to the 1st of January 2011. Will the Cabinet Secretary eh, ditch the scripted rhetoric on low pay and actually do something to help some of the lowest paid workers under her portfolio? Well, if the member was listening to my answer um, to Amit Taggart, she would realise that actually in this portfolio there have been more challenges than anywhere else. We've heard about the tightness of budgets, but despite that, despite having uh, one in the portfolio, many people who are very dedicated, who work in our collections in particular, but also in other areas of culture and heritage. Historic Scotland, you've seen the number of people who are stewards across the number of properties. And we've made sure that they have had a living wage not provided under the Labour Party when they were in government. But also, and those earning under £21,000, we've made sure that they get their uplift as well. A significant number operating in the sector. I've um, spoken myself to a number of the trade unions, also to the chair and the CEO of NMS. I do want to see resolution, but also uh, I think the member is misleading when he gives implication that people are not yeah. receiving or have had pay cuts. Nobody has received a pay cut and nobody will receive a pay cut. Well, thank you. Question 8, Bob Doris. An officer to ask the Scottish Government what international development support it is providing for people affected by the humanitarian crisis in Iraq. Mr. Humza Yousaf. The Scottish Government's International Development Fund currently focuses on providing support in seven priority countries. In addition to these, over the past two years, we've responded to humanitarian emergencies in the Philippines, Gaza, Syria uh, and West Africa. Uh, we have previously, of course, assisted uh, in Iraq for money that was confiscated from the WEIR group, but we don't have uh, plans uh, to extend that in the current international development funding round. We are, of course, closely monitoring the situation in Iraq, very concerned at the plight of the people who have been affected by the ongoing violence carried out by ISIL against innocent civilians, um, which we condemn in the strongest possible manner. Thank you. Bob Doris. Um, the Minister will know through meetings with myself and correspondence that I have made that suggestions have been made around how the pharmaceutical sector could help support with the humanitarian crisis and how Scottish Water and their expertise, for example, could help within refugee camps and the humanitarian crisis. I wonder what uh, formal contact uh, the Scottish Government consider giving to the Kurdish regional government to find out what specific bespoke and added value to the international aid effort in Iraq and in the wider region could be made and if you would meet with me to help coordinate those efforts to see what Scotland can do to play its part in this international crisis. Minister. I recognise the work that Bob Doris has done uh, with the people of the Kurdish uh, region and since his last meetings uh, with the then uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health, Alec Neil, officials then contacted the ABPI, the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industries, and they told us that they generally uh, the industry works through the International Health Partners, IHP, to donate medicines to those places in need. Uh, ABPI uh, have contacted IHP, are still awaiting uh, response from them, but on the back of Mr Doris's questions, I will certainly uh, chase them up uh, myself. In regards to Scottish water, this has been an issue that has been raised uh, previously, and the Scottish Government did, in fact, contact um, Scottish water to see what work they could do uh, with the region uh, of Kurdistan. And uh, those appropriate details were passed on to the KRG Government. It would be, of course, for the KRG Government to directly liaise uh, with uh, Scottish Water in order to, uh, to, to determine whether or not uh, there is some assistance that can be given. Uh, I am, of course, more than happy to meet the member, more than happy to meet representatives of the KRG, which we do on a regular basis. Question 9, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with Creative Scotland regarding long-term funding for the Gaelic Arts Agency pro project in Anielan. Cabinet uh, the the Minister, Minister for Learning, uh, Science and Scotland's Languages uh, met with the Chief Executive of Creative Scotland on the 11th of December and discussed Creative Scotland's support for Gaelic projects and initiatives. In this discussion, the role and funding of Project Nanyelan was discussed. Uh, ministers are aware of the strong record of PNE and are keen to see this continue and be built on in the years ahead. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply and I recognise her and the Scottish Government's strong support for Gaelic to date. 
Uh, clearly, however, the decision by Creative Scotland not to award annual client funding is disappointing, especially given that Borden and Gaelic submitted a letter in support of PNE's application and that PNE has now placed its staff under protective notice of redundancy. Given the Cabinet Secretary's widely recognised support for the Gaelic language, uh, I know she will appreciate the impact of the decision, so can I ask her to ensure Creative Scotland revisit the decision? Cabinet Secretary. It's the role and responsibility for Creative Scotland for their decisions. Um, difficult, difficult decisions had to be made. Remember, applications were £212 million for an available budget of £100 million. I reiterate um, our uh, view that we want p and &E to succeed in the future. They previously didn't have annual... Um, uh, funding they had uh, they'd previously not had foundation funding, they'd had annual project funding. They are still eligible for project funding, and I would strongly recommend that they apply for that project funding. And I think my message is about as clear as I can possibly make and my confidence in the ability of that particular organisation to succeed. Thank you. That ends portfolio questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12101 in the name of John Swinney.